Christ is alive. Hallelujah. Christ is risen indeed. Easter joy is here for all of us who choose to claim it. Feel our hearts expand like the buds that swell with moisture and warmth. May our hearts expand so there is no limit to our compassion, no border to our justice and our acting in love. Come and worship God, the one who brings about new life out of darkness, out of despair. For indeed, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Welcome, everyone, to this time of worship. My name is Kathy Underwood, and I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. And while my uh, role as a voluntary associate minister is with First United Church in Owen Sound, my formal ministry is as part of the palliative home care team, working with people who are dying and their families as they, as they learn to live with illness and to live fully until they die. It is a pleasure for me to be here today leading in worship. Particularly, I want to acknowledge uh, Ted Spencer, who will be accompanying uh, the hymns on the piano, also Lynn, who will be reading the scripture, and of course, all of the Netcast team who makes this possible. And mostly, I want to thank you, because you have chosen, for some reason, to take time out of your day to be with us. And so my prayer for all of us is that this time of worship is one in which we are encouraged and comforted, but also challenged and maybe even provoked. May the Spirit be among us this day. Let us pray. God, we praise you for your faithful, unending love, for the ways you gather us, uphold us, and enliven us. We praise you for your joy that springs out of despair. We praise you, O oh God, for all the signs of new life, for babies and bunnies and lambs, for daffodils and hyacinths and tulips. God, we praise you for this new life. As we worship together, O oh God, may we come to know a little about this new life and to feel ourselves enlivened. May this be so, O oh God. Amen. We continue in our worship by singing our first hymn of praise, Voices United 179, Hallelujah, Give Thanks.
sometimes in worship, we, um, we like to use some other stories, stories that will help us to understand the Bible story a little bit better. And so today, today I'd like to share with you a story about a mother bird and her baby bird. And it's based on the original story by P.D. Eastman called, Where is My Mother? But I've adapted it a little bit, so you may not recognize it if you've read this story before. So once upon a time, there was a mother bird who was sitting in her nest on one beautiful egg. And one day, as she was thinking about her egg, she thought, I wonder who my little bird will be. Will it be a little boy bird or a little girl bird? Or will it be something else altogether? So she said, I think I will name my little bird Terry. Because then it doesn't matter whether it's a boy or a girl or something in between. And she said, I am going to think of my baby bird as Terry. So she sat for a while longer on her egg. And suddenly, she felt the egg jump. And it jumped again. She said, oh my goodness, Terry might be on the way. When Terry arrives, I think Terry will be very hungry. And so I am going off to find something to eat. And off the mother bird flew away. Well, the egg, now that it didn't have the mother bird on top, could jump and jump and jump and jump and jump. And suddenly a crack began to form around the edge of the egg. And a moment later, whoa, out popped a baby bird. This was Terry. Terry ruffled their feathers and tried to get dry. And the first thing Terry said was, where is my mother? Terry looked up into the branches. No sign of a mother. Terry looked down over the edge of the nest. But there was no mother. So Terry kept ruffling their feathers to get dry, to get dry, and said, let us go, let me go. I cannot fly, but I think I can walk, and I will go and find my mother. So without one further thinking moment, Terry leapt out of the nest, down, 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 and then thump. And then Terry rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and, oh, looked up into the eyes of a kitten. And the kitten looked down at Terry. Terry looked up at the kitten and said, excuse me, are you my mother? Mew. Hmm, I guess you are not my mother. So off Terry went. And up ahead, Terry saw a chicken. It had feathers. Maybe that's my mother. So Terry went up to the chicken who was sitting on her own nest full of eggs and said, excuse me, are you my mother? And the hen, whose feathers were very ruffled to have been disturbed on her nest, said, Mark, what makes you think? I'm your mother. I'm a chicken. I guess you are not my mother, and the kitten is not my mother, so I better keep looking for my mother. And off Terry went. And soon Terry found something else lying underneath a bush. Ugh, said the dog. Excuse me, said Terry. Are you my mother? Woof, said the dog. I am not your mother. I am a dog. And with that, the dog stretched and got up and peed on the bush and nearly peed on Terry. <sighs> Terry was starting to get discouraged. But then the baby bird saw something up in the field, a big black and white thing, surrounded by other big black and white things. And so Terry went running up to the big black and white thing and said, Hello, are you my mother? Moo, said the cow. I am not your mother. A calf 
is my baby. Well, Terry was feeling somewhat rejected now. The dog was not his mother, the kitten, the chicken, the cow. None of these were his mother. Where was Terry's mother? And then Terry thought, I will go back to the nest. Perhaps that is where I will find my mother. So back Terry went as fast as baby bird's legs can run and got to the bottom of the tree where the nest was. And Terry called up into the tree, Hello! Where is my mother? And suddenly there was a whoosh! And the mother bird came and lit beside him on the ground and had in her mouth a great big juicy worm. And Terry said, You are my mother! And the mother bird said, and you are Terry, my baby bird. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting story for lots of reasons. But the reason that I want to talk about it is because in the story, we hear about lots of different ways that we can know things. I wonder, how did Terry know that the mother bird that lit beside him on the ground was really his mother. The mother bird didn't look like him. The mother bird didn't sound like him. The mother bird didn't move like him because she could fly and Terry couldn't. There were lots of things that were different between them and yet something in Terry knew that this was the mother bird. There are lots of ways of knowing. Sometimes we know things because we see them. Sometimes we know things because we hear them. Sometimes we know things because we smell them like a skunk. And sometimes we know things because we just know them. And the story that we're going to read from the Bible later on talks about Jesus and his friends and different ways of knowing. And the friends believed that it was really Jesus that they were meeting with, even though he had died and was somehow come back to them. They believed that it was Jesus, not because of what he sounded like, but because of what they saw in Jesus' hands. Marks from where the nails had pierced his hands and a big wound in his side from where a soldier's spear had pierced him. So the disciples and Thomas too believed because of things they saw. But then Jesus goes on to say, you know, that's okay, but really what we hope is that people will come to believe in their hearts, with their instincts, with their intuition. And I think we do that. We we together can learn how to have that heart knowing about Jesus by doing things like reading the stories, telling the stories over in a different way, asking questions, kind of pushing back at stories, spending time with other people who might believe differently. All of those are ways that we take stories that we have seen and heard and we turn them into our heart stories. So my hope is that as you, regardless of what age you are, my hope is that you will be a person who isn't afraid to hear the story and shake the story up a little bit and to get the story so that it really becomes your story. The story of Jesus in your life. And partly we do that by coming to church and spending time with other people who might not believe exactly what we believe, but who help us to figure it out. So I hope that story is meaningful to you in some way. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the other story about Thomas and the friends in just a few minutes. One of the things that we do in worship is pray together. And so what we're going to do next is exactly that. It's called the prayers of the people. 
And so we will gather our hearts and our minds together as we pray. Let us pray. We come before you this morning, O loving God, as ones who seek to love and live in the way of Jesus. And we look around us and there are so many needs. In this time of COVID-19, we sometimes find it so overwhelming that we just want to bury our heads in the sand and pray only for those we know. Sometimes, oh God, we don't know what to pray. And sometimes we don't want to pray for those who are unlike us or those who we judge to be undeserving. God, whatever we are feeling right now, we pray that you will open our hearts as we name these people and these places. We pray, O oh God, particularly for the family and friends of George Floyd as they continue to grieve his death. We pray also for Derek Chauvin as he deals with the impact of his actions on himself and others. We thank you, God, for jurors and judges and lawyers who exercised their responsibilities. And we pray, O oh God, for peace and understanding, not only in Minneapolis, but in every place, in our places where racism is present and hurts all of us. We pray, O oh God, for those in prison or recently released for those who struggle with addiction and the ones who struggle to support them, for those who are ill, whether ill in body, mind, or spirit, and those who work in healthcare and education and social services who work to support them. We pray, O oh God, for police and corrections officers, for grocery store workers, for people on the factory floor, for farmers who provide our food in many places and in many ways. We pray for all those who offer themselves as leaders in whatever roles. God, we pray for those with whom we most disagree, and especially for those we think of as our enemies. Not, O oh God, that they would be changed, but perhaps that we might be changed to better understand. And God, we pray for ourselves. You alone know what is hidden in our hearts, our anxieties, our gratitude, our joys, and our sadnesses. And in this time of silence, O oh God, we offer them to you. And we sum up all of our prayers, O oh God, using the prayer of Jesus, who prayed to God as a heavenly parent, a divine mother, a creative holy mystery. Today's scripture is taken from Luke 24, verses 36b to 48. Jesus appears to his disciples. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, 
Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. May God add to our understanding of these words. Amen. You heard earlier from Lynn as she read from the Gospel of Luke the story about Jesus appearing to his disciples after he had died. I'm going to tell this story, the same story, from a different gospel, from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. And listen for the differences and the things that are the same. So hear these words from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, And the disciples were in a house where they had shut and locked the doors because they were afraid for their lives. And suddenly Jesus appeared amongst them and said, Peace be with you. And then immediately Jesus Jesus showed the marks on his hands where the nails had pierced. And he showed them the wound in his side where the soldier's spear had made a deep hole. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw that it was the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As God sent me, so now I send you. Then he breathed upon them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And whenever you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, also called the twin, and also one of the twelve, was not with them on that night when Jesus appeared. So the other disciples told him later, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, until I have seen the marks in his side and in his hands and put my hand against his wounds, I will not believe. A week later, they were in the house again together, and this time Thomas was with the other disciples. And suddenly again, Jesus appeared amongst them and said, Peace be with you. And immediately Jesus turned to Thomas and said, Thomas, see the marks in my hands? Touch them. Put your hand against my wounded side. And Thomas said, It is you, 
my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to all of them, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have still come to believe. It's interesting to me that the chapter doesn't end there. The writer went on with these two verses to say this. Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples that are not written down in this book. But these things are written down so that you, without seeing, may yet come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that in your believing you may find life in his name. These are the stories of our faith tradition told and retold through countless generations. May each one of us have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are open to understand these stories in our place and in our time. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to now sing the story of Thomas by joining together in Voices United 185, You Tell Me That the Lord is Risen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, you who are the source of our strength, you who are our Redeemer. Amen. I'd like to start this reflection with a little game. And so each of you at home can play this game with me. I'm going to say a word or a name in particular or a phrase, and I want you to write down immediately what comes to mind when I say that. So let's start with this one. Ben Johnson. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is cheating at the 100 meters in the Olympics and losing his record. What about this one? Fake news. 
Who's that? I think you probably would say Donald Trump. What about Laura Secord? Well, you might say chocolate. Or you might say the woman who walked through 20 kilometers along that laneway, Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls, to warn the British that the American were invading, Americans were invading. And then the last one. What do you think of when I say Thomas? Well, most of us who grew up in the church, the first words that would come to mind would be Thomas the Doubter. And that's an interesting way of putting people into a little box. We do, as humans, have a way of categorizing people. We label them, we pigeonhole them, usually based on one interaction or one thing that they've said that caught on or one particular thing they did that caught our imagination. Putting people in nice, tidy little boxes is a really good way of kind of categorizing them into either we trust them or we don't trust them. We like them or we don't like them. This is a group that we applaud or this is a group that we jeer. Now, on the face of it, it makes our lives much easier when we think about this in a dualistic way. It's either good or it's bad. And Thomas, if he has to be put into the box of doubters, I think, I think he would fit in, in line with the, a long list of other doubters. Not necessarily religious doubters, but people who doubted the traditional kind of status quo, the orthodoxy of the day. Think about people like Galileo or Aristotle or Marie Curie or Isaac Newton or Charles Darwin. People who, through their doubt, led them to incredible discoveries and contributions to humanity. We have always thought about doubt as curiosity and something that is a necessary thing in science and literature and language and music. Very little would ever change were it not for the doubters, were it not for those who said, what if? It wasn't true exactly this way. And the same can be said of religious doubters. Had it not been for Martin Luther and other, many other reformers as well, Christians would, in the Western world, would still all be Roman Catholic, which in and of itself is not necessarily good or bad. It's just that Martin Luther doubted that the orthodoxy of the church was the only truth, or even was the correct truth. And he isn't the only one. Christianity isn't the only one that has evolved and changed over time. Every major religious tradition has moved and changed and evolved because of people within the tradition who doubted that the orthodoxy, or the right way, was necessarily the only way to understand truth. So even if Thomas is known only by being in the little box of doubters, I'd argue that he's in pretty darn good company, company that has helped us all to grow in our understanding. Doubting was never meant to be a negative activity. But in many circles, particularly in religious circles, Doubting has come to be understood as the antithesis, the opposite of faith. But for me, what is the antithesis of faith is not doubt, but rather certainty. The more sure that I am right, that my understanding is the only correct understanding, the less trust, the less faith I have to have. So for me, one of the keys to being a person of faith is being open to doubt. Not only my doubts, but also the doubts of others. 
Now, some would say, oh, sure, Kathy, you're going to be a, just a, a wisp of, of grass that goes back and forth and is blown about in your beliefs with every changing wind, every changing trend. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is a person of faith is someone who can sift and sort what we have believed and be able to let the beliefs go when they turn into chaff so that I don't get held captive to my old beliefs. I think many of us have allowed ourselves to become Sunday school Christians in that when we were growing up, we went regularly, perhaps to Sunday school, perhaps to church, and then we stopped for good reasons. But whatever it was that we believed on the last day we went to Sunday school is pretty much what we believe now. And that is just not consistent with the way of Jesus or the way of the Christian church. And the problem is that it might be slowing you down and holding you captive to beliefs that really aren't your beliefs anymore. So that's one way of thinking about the whole doubt thing. But I really want us to go back to Thomas because Thomas cannot be put or should not be put into that little box that is just doubting. Because Thomas was way more than that one story about him that we read from Luke and also in the Gospel of John. Thomas not only grew through his doubt, but he also demonstrated his faith in countless other ways that you and I rarely think about. So I want you to hear just briefly a few of the other references to Thomas from the New Testament. In Mark 3 and Luke 6, we learn that Thomas, along with Simon and Andrew, were all called by Jesus. And like the other disciples, Thomas gave up everything to follow Jesus. Thomas in that moment was a man of certainty, a man who knew this adventure is one I want to be a part of, a man of adventure. In Matthew 10, the disciples are sent out in pairs by Jesus into the towns and villages so that they can learn not only how to preach the way of Jesus, but also to heal and to bring about health and wholeness. Matthew was paired up with Thomas. And the two of them together went into towns and villages and were men of action. They learned how to preach through their actions and to learn from their mistakes. Then later, in John 10, we read about a time when all the other disciples were trying to talk Jesus out of going back into Judea because they feared that Jesus' life would be in danger. And it is Thomas who speaks up and says, no, we need to listen to what Jesus is saying, and if he's going, we all go. And if it means we die, then we die. Thomas was a man who trusted Jesus implicitly. He was a man who was willing to give himself completely to the work of Jesus' life. In John 14, he also shows himself to be someone who's not afraid to look stupid in front of the other disciples by asking a question. It's one of those times that Jesus is giving one of those really long lectures. And at one point, Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas pipes up with, but Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Probably every other disciple was thinking it, but Thomas was the one who was unafraid to voice it. He was a man who was not afraid to learn and to ask questions. And then the final two references in the Christian scriptures to Thomas come in John 21 and also in Acts 1. And they both follow that famous episode of Thomas the Doubter. And in both of these, I think the writers of the Gospel of John and the Book of Acts 
found it important to include Thomas in these stories, to show that Thomas was present in every interaction that followed the doubting episode. To show that, what's his name? Thomas. (laughs) Thomas was not going to make the same mistake twice. He was not going to miss out on another appearance by Jesus. He was going to be in the thick of this new movement that was emerging out of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And finally, what most of us don't know about Thomas is that following Jesus' death and resurrection and the emergence of the very early Christian church, that Thomas chose to leave Jerusalem, chose to leave the Roman Empire, and went all the way to India, to the south of India, where he founded what is known as the Church of Thomas, the Thomasine Church, the Syriac Church, that persists to this day. You see, we can't squeeze Thomas into a little doubting box. His life is so much bigger than that. And if nothing else, this story tells us that none of us belong in a box. Perhaps you have had times in your life where you have felt that because of one thing you did or one thing you said, that a whole group of people tried to pigeonhole you and categorize you and stick you in a little box. Perhaps you're feeling like that right now. And what I would say to you that, if nothing else, look to the life of Thomas, not the life of the doubter, but the life that is so much bigger than doubt. All of us are unique, wonderfully complex, complicated people. So we need to be gentle with one another. We need to hold our truth gently so that you can hold your truth gently and together perhaps we can doubt and learn and wonder together. Let us not pretend, my friends, that we belong in boxes. Let us not pretend that Jesus' story or the story of God can be put into a tiny little correct box. But instead, let us have the faith to live boldly and bravely into the way of the Spirit that is constantly moving and changing and dancing us forward into ever new understandings and to ever new expressions of who we can be as a people of God. May this be so for you this day. Amen. And thanks be to God. And our final hymn together is When Thomas Heard from Jesus. These are new lyrics written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette in 2017, and she, as as an American composer of many hymns, has, uh, has offered this for, uh, to us to use freely with her permission uh, during this COVID time. So with thanks to Carolyn Winfrey Gillette and to the tune of The Church's One Foundation.
we have come to know God in this place. We have heard about the risen Christ, and perhaps we have come to know in new ways that Christ is alive. Alleluia. And as we leave this place, may we go knowing that we are blessed, not for ourselves, but blessed to be a blessing in our time and in our place and in every place where we find ourselves this day. Go in peace, knowing that God goes with you. Amen.